Robert the Bruce was a legendary Scottish king who reigned from 1306 until his death in 1329. His journey to the throne was marked by chaotic internal conflict and the struggle for Scottish independence from England. Initially, he was a nobleman, torn between allegiances. His commitment to Scotland's independence crystallized after he killed his rival, John Comyn, leading to his excommunication and eventually his coronation as King of the Scots. His most famous victory came later, in 1314, at the Battle of Bannockburn, where his forces defeated a much larger English army led by King Edward II, securing de facto independence for Scotland. Hello, welcome to the channel. If you are new here, good to meet you, and if you're coming back, great to have you back with me again. As always, if you want to support the channel, the best thing you can do is like, comment, and subscribe. Those who want to go above and beyond may refer to the description of the video. Now, without further ado, let us all get relaxed, take deep breaths, and we can begin our biography of Robert the Bruce. Robert the Bruce, born on July 11th, 1274, came into the world amidst uncertainty about his birthplace, although Turnbury Castle in Ayrshire is considered the most likely location, mainly due to its association with his mother's earldom. However, alternate claims do suggest Lochmaben in Dumreeshire, or Riddle in Essex. The Bruce lineage actually goes back quite a bit, tracing back to the first Lord of Annandale, Robert de Bruce. Don't get confused, that's B-R-U-S, not B-R-U-C-E. Well, it was he who settled in Scotland during the reign of King David I and received the Lordship of Annandale in 1124. Robert was the eldest son among ten children of Robert de Bruce, the sixth Lord of Annandale, and Marjorie, the Countess of Carrick. Through his mother he inherited the Earldom of Carrick, while his father bestowed upon him the Lordship of Annandale, along with the royal lineage as a fourth great-grandson of David I, granting him a potential claim to the Scottish throne. Beyond the Lordship of Annandale, the Bruce family held extensive lands in Aberdeenshire and Dundee, as well as substantial estates across England, including Cumberland, County Durham, Middlesex, Yorkshire, and more. Also a claim in County Antrim in Ireland. Little is known about Robert the Bruce's youth. It is likely that he was raised in a blend of Anglo-Norman and Gaelic cultures, reflecting the diverse regions of northern England and southeastern Scotland. Annandale, where he grew up, was heavily feudalized, with Northern Middle English, which was a precursor to Scots, commonly spoken. In contrast, Carrick, his purported birthplace, retained a strong Celtic and Gaelic-speaking society. Now, in terms of being trilingual, that probably happened quite early on, mainly just due to the nature of the circumstance and those who surrounded him. Robert had managed to speak Anglo-Norman, Gaelic, and early Scots, all quite fluently at that. Additionally, as the heir to a significant estate, 
he would have probably been familiar with Latin, which was necessary for legal and religious purposes. His education would have covered various subjects, including law, politics, theology, and, of course, a good dose of chivalry and the knightly arts, all very common for any European noble of the day. Well, as king, Robert likely commissioned verse to commemorate the events of the Battle of Bannockburn and a few others. He also supported his son's education by hiring Dominican friars as tutors and providing them with a good deal of books. Historical documents, at least the ones we have discovered up till now, suggest that Robert had a keen interest in ancient rulers and their governance, using their examples to inform his own rule. Well, tutors for the young Robert and his brothers were most likely drawn from the unbeneficed clergy, or perhaps mendicant friars associated with the churches patronized by their family. Additionally, they would have had masters from their parents' household to instruct them in various skills, including horsemanship, swordsmanship, hunting, and, of course, courtly behavior. Must remember our table manners. Aspects of chivalry, integral to personal and leadership development, were likely taught by a reputable knight, possibly drawn from his grandfather's retinue from the crusade. This grandfather, by the way, known as Robert the Noble, or Bruce the Competitor, appears to have been a significant influence on the future king, evident in Robert's later prowess in war tactics, and also single combat, which he also excelled at quite nicely. The Bruce family frequently moved between their castles, including Lochmarben Castle in Annandale and Turnbury on Loch Doon Castle in Carrick. Additionally, Robert and his siblings may have experienced fosterage within allied Gaelic kindreds, a traditional practice in Carrick and other regions. This fosterage would have provided them with exposure to Gaelic culture, and, with that, warfare tactics, as the two were, let's just say, one and the same. While this potentially influenced rather Robert's later affinity for Hobelar warfare, as it is called, and, of course, sea power. Historians looking back have suggested that Robert and his brother Edward, approached the age of twelve, may have been sent to reside with allied English noble families, such as the de Clares of Gloucester, or even in the English royal household itself. While there is limited evidence of Robert's presence at Edward's court, records do indicate that he and his father were pursued for debts, suggesting occasional residence in royal centres frequented by King Edward I. Robert's first documented appearance was a witness on a charter issued by Alexander Og MacDonald, Lord of Eastleigh, when he was sixteen years old. This coincided with the death of Margaret, the Maid of Norway in 1290, around the time Robert would have been knighted and began to emerge on the political stage in support of the Bruce dynastic interests. Following his mother's death in the early days of 1292, significant political developments unfolded in Scotland. In November of the same year, Edward I of England, acting on behalf of the Guardians of Scotland, and in accordance with the Great Cause, awarded the vacant crown of Scotland to John Balliol, who was Robert the Bruce's grandfather's first cousin once removed. 
In response to these events, Robert de Bruce, the fifth Lord of Annandale, that is, once again, de Bruce, made a strategic move by reassigning his lordship of Annandale and transferring his claim to the Scottish throne to his son. Anticipating this decision, made on the 7th of November, Robert de Bruce, the sixth Lord of Annandale, relinquished his earldom of Carrick to his eldest son, Robert, who would later become king. They should have chosen different names, I know. Well, this maneuver aimed to safeguard the Bruce family's claim to the throne, while their middle lord, Robert de Bruce's father, held only English lands. Although the Bruce's attempt to claim the throne ended in failure, the success of the Balliols propelled an 18-year-old Robert the Bruce onto the political stage in his own right, marking the beginning of his significant involvement in Scottish affairs. Following John's ascension to the throne, Edward persisted in asserting his authority over Scotland, leading to strained relations between the two kings. The Bruces aligned themselves with King Edward against King John and his Comyn allies, viewing John as a usurper of the throne. Well, despite Scottish objections, Edward I agreed to hear appeals on cases decided by the Guardian's court during the interregnum. Tensions escalated when Macduff, the son of Malcolm, Earl of Fife, brought a case demanding John's appearance before the English Parliament to answer charges. Although John complied, the breaking point came when Edward demanded Scottish magnates provide military support for England's war against France. This demand led the Scots to form an alliance with France. Well, the Comyn dominated council acting on behalf of King John summoned the Scottish host to convene at Cadon Lee on the 11th of March. However, the Bruces, along with the Earls of Angus and March, refused to attend. In response, the Bruce family temporarily withdrew from Scotland, while the Comines seized their estates in Annandale and Carrick, granting them to John Comine, the Earl of Buchan. Seeking refuge, the Bruces found sanctuary under Edward I, who appointed the Lord of Annandale to command Carlisle Castle in October of 1295. In early 1296, Robert married his first wife, Isabella of Mar, the daughter of Domnal I, Earl of Mar. But tragically, she didn't last very long. Isabella passed away shortly after their marriage, possibly during or from complications arising from childbirth. And they only had one child. They named her Marjorie. The initial clash in the conflict between Scotland and England targeted the Bruces directly. On the 26th of March, 1296, Easter Monday, by the way, seven Scottish earls launched a surprise assault on the walled city of Carlisle. This attack, while seemingly directed against England, was primarily aimed at the Cumin Earl of Buchan, and their faction especially, who were perceived as adversaries by the Bruces. Given that both his father and grandfather had served as governors of the castle in the past, Robert the Bruce likely possessed first-hand knowledge of its defences. And it's worth noting that in 1315, Robert the Bruce would himself lead a personal assault on Carlisle. In response to King John's alliance with France and the attack on Carlisle, Edward I invaded Scotland, 
by the end of March 1296. The English forces seized the town of Berwick in a particularly bloody assault, easily smashing apart the flimsy palisade that surrounded it. A palisade is kind of like a... Uh, it's a wooden wall. You have rammed earth on the bottom and they stick up a bunch of logs and reinforce them. It's what you have when you don't have a stone wall. At the Battle of Dunbar, Scottish resistance was effectively crushed, leading to the deposition of King John and the installation of English governors in Scotland. While the campaign was initially successful for the English, their triumph would prove to be only temporary. Although the Bruces had regained possession of Annandale and Carrick, in August 1296, both Robert Bruce, Lord of Annandale, and his son, Robert Bruce, Earl of Carrick, swore allegiance to King Edward I, along with over 1,500 other Scots at Berwick. However, when the Scottish revolt against Edward erupted in July of 1297, James Stuart, the fifth High Steward of Scotland, led his own rebellion. The young Robert Bruce, now twenty-two, joined the rebels, independently of his father, who remained neutral and sought refuge in Carlisle. Robert Bruce appears to have been influenced by his grandfather's associates, Wishart and Stuart, who inspired him to resist against Edward I. With the outbreak of the revolt, Robert left Carlisle and rallied the knights of his ancestral lands in Annandale, appealing to their loyalty and camaraderie. Bruce defied orders to support Edward's commander, John de Warren, the sixth Earl of Surrey, despite their familial relation. Instead, he remained steadfast in support for the revolt against Edward I. Evidence of Bruce's prominent role in inciting rebellions can be found in a letter from High Hugh Rather Cressingham to Edward, dated the 23rd of July 1292, which suggests that Bruce's allegiance would greatly benefit Edward's cause. On the 7th of July, Bruce and his allies negotiated terms with Edward through the capitulation of Irvine, where they agreed not to serve overseas against their will, and were pardoned for the recent violence. They also swore allegiance to King Edward. However, Bruce never delivered his infant daughter Marjorie as a hostage as stipulated in the agreement. Following King Edward's return to England after the Battle of Falkirk, the Bruce's possessions were excluded from the lands assigned to Edward's followers. The reason for this exemption still remains a little unclear. Fordun recounts that Robert's alleged participation in the battle under Antony Beck, the Bishop of Durham, but this claim is also disputed. Additionally, Bruce is said to have taken drastic measures in the following month, destroying Annandale and burning Eyre Castle to prevent its occupation by the English. Now, following William Wallace's resignation as Guardian of Scotland after his defeat at the Battle of Falkirk, Robert Bruce and John Comyn assumed joint guardianship. However, their stark personal differences pretty much rendered effective governance impossible. Comyn, with his allegiance to King John, and a substantial claim to the Scottish throne of his own, stood as Bruce's adversary. In an attempt to mediate, William Lamberton, Bishop of St Andrews, was appointed as a neutral third guardian in 1299. Yet the tensions, well, they persisted on and on. 
prompting Bruce's eventual resignation as joint guardian in favour of Sir Gilbert de Umfraville, the Earl of Angus, in 1300. In the May of 1301, Umfraville, Cumin, and Lamberton also stepped down, paving the way for Sir John de Soles to assume sole guardianship. Soles, who was chosen for his impartiality, actively sought to restore King John to the Scottish throne. Meanwhile, Edward I's sixth campaign into Scotland commenced in the July of 1301, capturing strategic locations, but ultimately failing to cripple Scottish resistance. A truce was agreed upon finally in the January of 1302. Bruce's allegiances shifted during this period, culminating in his submission to Edward alongside other nobles, signalling a pragmatic approach to the ongoing conflict. Rumours circulated regarding John Balliol's potential return, supported by souls and other nobles, though it proved to be unfounded. In 1302, Bruce actually penned a letter of apology to Melrose Abbey, acknowledging his error in requisitioning their tenants without a national mandate. He pledged future cooperation only in defence of the realm, and in that same year he remarried Elizabeth de Burg, solidifying his ties with the powerful Ulster earldom. Edward's renewed invasion in 1303 led to widespread submission, with leading Scots, excluding William Wallace, surrendering by February 1304. Bruce and Lamberton forged an alliance in the June of 1304, indicative of their shared patriotism despite their earlier capitulation to the English. Subsequent governance arrangements saw Edward's nephew, the Earl of Richmond, spearhead the Scottish administration. Meanwhile, Wallace's capture and execution in 1305 showed the English crown's uh, determination to quell any resistance. And it was quite a brutal one. Yeah. It was not a slow death for William Wallace, I'm afraid. Well, Edward's distrust of Bruce became apparent in directives concerning Kildrame Castle's custody, and also the revocation of land grants in 1305. Despite Edward's suspicions, Bruce, now the Earl of Carrick and the seventh Lord of Annandale, wielded considerable influence and a formidable claim to the Scottish throne. His conviction in his right to the throne was unwavering and uncompromising, but his aspirations, they faced resistance from John Comyn, another staunch supporter of John Balliol. Comyn wielded significant influence as one of Scotland's most powerful nobles, with extensive familial ties not only just across Scotland but England as well boasting connections to various earldoms, lordships and sheriffdoms, quite a lengthy CV. Moreover, his lineage traced back to Donald III and David I, further bolstering his claim to the Scottish throne. Well, according to Barbour and Fordon, a clandestine agreement purportedly saw come in renounce his claim to the throne in favour of Bruce, contingent upon Bruce leading a rebellion. However, upon learning of Edward's the first plan to apprehend him, Bruce fled the English court, apparently tipped off by one Ralph de Montherma. Bruce's escape hinted at the imminent rupture of his relationship with Comyn. 
The Chronicle of Barbar recounts a fateful encounter between Bruce and Comin in Dumfries, where a dispute erupted. In fact, it was such an eruption that it culminated in Bruce fatally stabbing Comin to death. Right at the altar in the Greyfriars Monastery, by the way. Well, accounts do differ regarding the aftermath with some alleging Bruce's supporters dealt the fatal blow. Well, either way, the incident marked a decisive turn in Bruce's pursuit of the Scottish crown. Following this, Bruce seized Dumfries Castle, before seeking absolution from Bishop Robert Wishart in Glasgow, who called upon the clergy to rally behind Bruce's cause, despite the excommunication that followed. Six weeks after these dramatic events, Robert the Bruce ascended to the Scottish throne in a very majestic coronation ceremony at Scone, near Perth on Palm Sunday. Bishop William de Lamberton officiated the ceremony on March 25, 1306, with the utmost formality and solemnity. The bishop brought forth the royal robes and vestments, carefully concealed from the English eyes by Robert Wishart to adorn King Robert, surrounded by the bishops of Moray and Glasgow, along with esteemed earls such as Athol, Mendieth, Lennox and Mar. Behind the throne of Bruce stood the proud banner of the kings of Scotland, symbolising his authority and lineage. The significance of this event was underscored by the arrival of Isabella, the Countess of Buchan, the following day. And despite missing the initial coronation, Isabella, invoking her family's ancient rites, arranged for a second ceremony. With regal dignity, she placed the crown once more upon the brow of Robert the Bruce, reaffirming his title as Earl of Carrick, Lord of Annandale, and the King of the Scots. In the spring of 1306, Edward I embarked on another northern campaign, further solidifying his grip on Scotland. As he marched through, he ruthlessly confiscated the Scottish estates of Robert the Bruce and his supporters, redistributing them among his own followers. To intensify the pressure, Edward issued a decree excommunicating Bruce, branding him as an outlaw and a threat to the realm. Which was funny because it was his realm. How can you threaten your own realm? Well, in June of that year, Bruce faced a significant setback at the Battle of Methven, where he suffered a crushing defeat. But despite the loss, his resolve remained unbroken. This was a battle, not a war. As the situation grew increasingly perilous, he made a strategic decision to ensure the safety of his family. In August, his wife, his daughters, and other women from his party sought refuge at Kildrame Castle, under the guardianship of Bruce's brother, Neil, the Earl of Athol, accompanied by the remaining men who were of the most highest loyal degree. Bruce himself, well, he was accompanied by a small but fiercely devoted band of followers, and among them included Sir James Douglas and Gilbert Hay, along with his brothers Thomas, Alexander, and Edward, as well as Sir Neil Campbell and the Earl of Lennox, who chose to evade capture and continue the fight. However, these efforts were soon met with a severe blow. On the 13th of September 1306, Kildrummy Castle fell to a formidable force led by Edward, the Prince of Wales, Nigel de Bruce, the king's youngest brother, along with Robert Boyd and Alexander Lindsay, were captured. 
Despite Boyd's escape, Nigel, the Bruce, and Lindsay faced execution in Berwick under King Edward's orders to eliminate all loyalists of Robert de Bruce. Sir Simon Fraser suffered a similar fate, but they took him all the way to London to make a public show of it all. Nothing better than a public execution, right? Well, the plight of Bruce's family worsened when, just before the castle's fall, the Earl of Athol made a desperate bid to rescue Queen Elizabeth de Burgh, Marguerite de Bruce, and King Robert's sisters, along with Isabella of Fife. However, their efforts were betrayed, resulting in the capture by the English. Athol was taken to London to be executed, and the women were endured to a very harsh confinement, locked in a cold, wet room. Castles are not the best places for extended stays. The winter of 1306-07 remains a little bit of a mystery regarding Robert's whereabouts. However, it seems probable that he sought refuge in the Hebrides during this period, potentially finding shelter under the protection of Christina of the Isles. Christina, married to a member of the Mar kindred, had familial ties to Bruce through his first wife and her brother, Gartnate, who was married to a sister of Bruce. Alternatively, Ireland presents itself as a viable option for Bruce's sanctuary during this time. While Orkney, then under Norwegian rule, or Norway proper, where his sister Isabel Bruce held the title of Queen Dowager, seems a little less likely, but they cannot be entirely discounted. Well, if it were me, I would have chose somewhere a little bit warmer. In February 1307, Bruce and his followers made a daring return to the Scottish mainland, arriving in two separate groups. One contingent, led by Bruce himself and his brother Edward, landed at Turnbury Castle, initiating a guerrilla warfare campaign in southeastern Scotland. Southwestern Scotland, rather, excuse me. Well, the other group, which was led by Bruce's brothers, Thomas and Alexander, landed slightly further south in Loch Ryan, but tragically met their demise as they were captured and summarily executed, which was the style at the time. Well, by April, Bruce had already marked his presence with a small yet significant victory over the English at the Battle of Glentrool. Following this triumph, he confronted Aymer de Valence, the second Earl of Pembroke, at the Battle of Loden Hill, emerging victorious again, on a bit of a roll, it seems. Concurrently, James Douglas made his inaugural expedition on behalf of Bruce into southwestern Scotland, demonstrating his allegiance by attacking and incinerating his own castle at Douglas Glade, and if anything shows commitment to a cause, it's doing an arson attack on your own home. While well, leaving his brother Edward in charge in Galloway, Bruce embarked on a northern campaign, seizing Inverlochy and the Urquhart castles, while laying waste to Inverness Castle and Nairn. Although his attempt to threaten Elgin proved unsuccessful, Bruce's momentum continued to build. Then, on July the 7th, 1307, King Edward passed away. Rest in pieces. Leaving Bruce to face opposition from the late king's son, Edward II, as he pursued his quest for Scottish independence. In late 1307, Bruce shifted his operations to Aberdeenshire, 
where he posed a threat to the Banff before falling seriously ill, likely due to the hardships endured during the prolonged campaign. But don't worry, he got better. After recuperating, despite leaving John Comyn, the third Earl of Buckend, unsubdued in his rear, I know, right? Bruce redirected his efforts westward. He seized Balvenie and Dufus castles, followed by Taradale castles on the Black Isle. Bruce then retraced his steps through the hinterlands of Inverness, marking a second unsuccessful attempt to capture Elgin. However, his fortunes changed dramatically, with a landmark victory over Comyn at the Battle of Inverurie in the May of 1308, which paved the way for subsequent triumphs. And of course, that's a different Comyn, by the way, the third Earl of Buchan. All the Scots seem to have rather similar names, so we'll try to keep up. In a swift and relentless campaign, Bruce overran Buchan and defeated the English garrison at Aberdeen. The harrying of Buchan in 1308 aimed to eradicate all support for the Comyn family, who still commanded loyalty in the region, despite their defeat. Bruce's forces demolished most of the Comyn castles in Moray, Aberdeen, and Buchan, and dealt a decisive blow to the once powerful family's influence in the north, which had endured for nearly a century. The rapid success of Bruce's campaign, particularly in capturing northern castles, remains somewhat of a mystery. Without significant siege weapons and no apparent numerical or technological superiority over his opponents, Bruce's achievements defy easy explanation. The lack of morale and effective leadership among the Gumeans and their allies is probably what contributed to their swift downfall in the face of Bruce's resolute challenge. Well, after these events, Bruce turned his attention toward Argyll, where he defeated the isolated MacDougalls, staunch allies of the Gumeans, at the Battle of Pass of Brander. He subsequently seized Duff Stanage Castle, the final major stronghold of the Comyns and their allies. Bruce's campaign continued with harrying raids in Argyll and Kintyre, targeting the territories of Clan MacDougall. In March 1309, he convened his first parliament at St Andrews, and by August of the same year, he had established control over all of Scotland north of the River Tay. The clergy of Scotland formally recognised Bruce as a king at a general council the following year, despite his excommunication, showing there was more political significance for their support. In October of 1310, Bruce made an unsuccessful attempt to broker peace between Scotland and England, writing to Edward II from Kildrum in Coubernauld Parish. Over the next three years, Bruce's forces systematically captured and subdued English-held castles and outposts, including Linlithgow in 1310 and Dumbarton in 1311, followed by Perth in the January of 1312. He also conducted raids into northern England, and laid siege to Castle Rushen in Castleton, Isle of Man, capturing it on the 21st of June 1313, thus denying the English strategic control over the island. Bruce's eight years of relentless resistance against the English, marked by guerrilla tactics and strategic warfare, has earned him a place among the great guerrilla leaders of history despite his upbringing as a feudal knight. Now, the following year, 314, by this time Robert the Bruce had succeeded in recapturing 
most of the castles in Scotland that were held by the English. His forces were even conducting raids into northern England as far as Carlisle. In response to this growing success, Edward II of England devised a major military campaign with the support of Lancaster and the barons, and they massed a sizable army, estimated between fifteen to twenty thousand men. Thus, in the spring of the same year, 1314, Edward Bruce commenced the siege of Stirling Castle, a crucial stronghold in Scotland, whose governor, Philip de Mowbray, agreed to surrender, if not relieved before the 24th of June, 1314. Meanwhile, James Douglas captured Roxburgh, and Randolph took control of Edinburgh Castle. Bruce, in an act of retribution, ordered the execution of Piers de Lombard, the governor of Edinburgh Castle. Additionally, Bruce raided England once again, and finally subdued the Isle of Man. Upon learning of the agreement regarding Stirling Castle, Edward II hastened his march northward from Berwick to relieve the besieged fortress. Robert the Bruce, commanding between 5,000 and 6,000 troops, primarily armed with spears, prepared to intercept Edward's forces and prevent them from reaching Stirling. Thus, the Battle of Bannockburn commenced on the 23rd of June, as the English army attempted to navigate the challenging terrain of the Bannockburn surrounded by marshland. Skirmishes erupted between the two sides, resulting in the death of Sir Henry de Bowen, who was slain in personal combat by Robert the Bruce himself. The following day, the bulk of the Scottish army emerged from the woods of Newpark to confront the advancing English forces. The English army, unprepared for battle, and deployed in marching order rather than battle formation, found themselves struggling to manoeuvre in the cramped terrain. Robert's spearmen, effectively utilising the landscape to their advantage, overwhelmed the English cavalry. Thus the English army, completely unable to regain control, suffered heavy losses, a calamity for the English. Well, Edward II, he was there too, but he narrowly escaped the battlefield, pursued closely by the Scottish forces. In the aftermath of the defeat, Edward retreated to Dunbar, and then sailed to Berwick before returning to York. During his absence, Stirling Castle fell to the Scots, solidifying Robert the Bruce's victory at Bannockburn. Freed from the English threats, at least the immediate ones, Robert the Bruce's armies turned their attention to invading northern England. Bruce successfully repelled a subsequent English expedition across the border, and launched daring raids into Yorkshire and Lancashire. His military successes bolstered his confidence, leading him to make bold strategic moves. Thus, in 1315, Bruce dispatched his brother Edward to invade Ireland, aiming to assist the Irish lords in resisting the English encroachments and reclaiming lost lands. This decision was prompted by offers of assistance from Domnell and Neil, the king of Tyr Eogain, and sorry for the pronunciations. Edward's invasion was met with some success and he was crowned as King of Ireland in 1316. Robert later joined his brother in Ireland with another army to provide additional support. Robert the Bruce also embarked on a propaganda campaign promoting an ideological vision of a pan-Gaelic Greater Scotia, 
his words not mine, where his lineage would rule over both Ireland and Scotland. This vision was supported by his marriage alliance with the de Burr family of the Earldom of Ulster in Ireland, established in 1302. Furthermore, Bruce himself boasted Gaelic royal lineage on his mother's side of Carrick, tracing back prominent figures such as Eof of Leinster, whose ancestors included Brian Boru of Munster and the kings of Leinster. By strategically leveraging his familial ties and ancestry, Bruce sought to foster a sense of unity among Scottish and Irish Gaelic populations, of course, under his kingship. And we actually have a letter here that he sent to some of the Irish chiefs. I don't know how it survived, but we have it. And I'll read from it now. Whereas we, and you, and our people, and your people, free since ancient times, share the same national ancestry, and are urged to come together more eagerly and joyfully in friendship by a common language and by common customs, we have sent you our beloved kinsmen, the bearers of this letter, to negotiate with you in our name about permanently strengthening and maintaining inviolate the special friendship between us and you, so that, with God's will, our nation may be able to recover her ancient liberty. The diplomatic efforts of Robert the Bruce and his alliance with the Irish chiefs, particularly in Ulster, yielded some degree of support for the Scots in Ireland, Domnall O'Neill, an influential Irish chief, justified his backing of the Scots to Pope John the Twenty-Second by highlighting the shared ancestry and cultural ties between the two nations. Initially, the combined Scot-Irish army appeared formidable, achieving repeated victories against the English and devastating their towns. However, this success was limited by their inability to garner support from non-Ulster chiefs and make significant advances in the southern regions of Ireland. Many Irish people in the south perceived little distinction between the English and the Scottish occupation. Well, the campaign faced additional challenges when Ireland was struck by a famine, severely impacting the army's ability to sustain itself. Desperate for provisions, the Scots resorted to pillaging and indiscriminately laying waste to settlements, regardless of their allegiance. This indiscriminate behaviour, of course, further alienated the potential Irish allies. Well, ultimately, the campaign met its end with the death of Edward Bruce at the Battle of Foggart. The defeat was viewed as a kind of relief by many in Ireland, as it brought an end to the famine and the pillaging inflicted by both the Scots and the English. The Irish annals of the period celebrated the defeat of the Bruces by the English as a significant event in Irish history, emphasising the relief it brought to the suffering population. Well, Robert the Bruce's reign was marked by significant diplomatic achievements, notably the Declaration of Arbroath in 1320, which bolstered his position especially with the papacy, and ultimately Pope John the Twenty Second lifted the excommunication, which was very nice of him. Another pivotal moment came in May 1328, when King Edward III of England signed the Treaty of Edinburgh Northampton, formally recognising Scotland as an independent kingdom, with Bruce 
as its rightful king. In 1325, Robert acquired lands at Cadros, exchanging them for Old Montross in Angus, Scotland, with Sir David Graham. This marked the beginning of the construction of a manor house that would become Bruce's favoured residence in his final years. Detailed records from 1328 describe the manor house at Cadros, boasting royal chambers, a chapel, kitchens, and even a medicinal garden. It was a modest, yet comfortable dwelling, perhaps reflecting Bruce's empathy for his subjects who had endured the hardships of war, famine, and pandemics. By 1327, Robert had been suffering from a serious illness, with contemporary accounts suggesting that it was leprosy. However, modern scholarship debates this diagnosis, considering alternative possibilities, perhaps tuberculosis, eczema, or even syphilis, maybe even a series of strokes. Well, despite his illness, there's no evidence of Bruce being segregated from his associates, indicating that he continued to lead actively until his death. As his health deteriorated, Robert sought solace and healing at Glenluce Abbey, Monrath, and eventually at the shrine of St. Ninian of Whithorn. It's said that he fasted and prayed for several days, before returning by sea to Cadros. During his final days, Robert convened a council with his prelates and barons, making generous gifts to religious institutions, and expressing remorse for not fulfilling a vow to embark on a crusade. He expressed his final wish was that his heart would be embalmed and taken on pilgrimage to the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, accompanied by a company of knights led by Sir James Douglas, before being interned at Melrose Abbey upon its return. He also made arrangements for perpetual soul masses to be conducted at various religious sites, including the chapel of St. Serf in Ayr, and the Dominican Friary in Berwick, as well as Dunfermline Abbey. Well, the time had to come that Robert the Bruce passed away on June the 7th, 1329, at the manor of Cadros near Dumbarton. Despite not fulfilling his vow to embark on the crusade, he died fulfilled knowing that his lifelong struggle for recognition of the Bruce right to the crown had well and truly been achieved, and he was confident in leaving the Kingdom of Scotland in capable hands of his trusted lieutenant, Moray, until his infant son reached adulthood. Just six days after his death, papal bulls were issued granting the privilege of unaction at the coronation of future kings of Scots, further solidifying his triumph. The exact cause of his death remains a little unclear. While contemporary chroniclers accuse him of having leprosy, none of the Scottish accounts of his death suggest such a condition. Well, of course, there's plenty of modern hypotheses including the aforementioned. Also, cancer and motor neuron disease have been proposed. Some even suggest that his rich court diet, including reportedly copious amounts of eels, very English for a Scotsman to eat that many eels, well, that might have contributed to his health issues in later years. Just too many eels, it seems. Well, a team of researchers led by Professor Andrew Nelson from the University of Western Ontario conducted a study on the original casting of Robert the Bruce's descendant, Lord Andrew Douglas Alexander Thomas Bruce's skull and a foot bone. And their analysis found no signs of leprosy. 
such as eroded nasal spine or penciling of the foot bone, pretty common signs of the disease, which of course, well, as far as I'm concerned, it's proof enough that he wasn't a leper. Well, thank you very much for listening. A bit of a long one today. I'd like to thank my patrons, Stark Factory, JC and Jeffrey. Thank you, lads. And if you'd like to make a contribution, you know what to do. Have a look in the description. But until next time, hopefully I'll see you tomorrow. Make sure you rest well. Good night, everyone.